good evening. How are we doing? Uh, first of all, big hand for Parry Jack for opening up. And what a lovely room to do something like this. Week. My name is Miles Hunt. My day job is playing in a band called The Wonder Stuff. And uh, when I'm not doing that, I happily get talked into things such as this. I, uh, I released a solo album at the tail end of last year. I'm going to do a couple of tracks from that tonight. Uh, but before I do, I want to play a few songs that you stand a chance of knowing. guitar solo of swords. I say of swords because it's just Maltrice throwing his guitar around his head and getting a load of feedback. Well there ain't no Maltrice up on the stage here tonight. So, I am going to be encouraging this evening some audience participation. And here comes the first bit. So to cover Mount, feedback bit, I would like all the ladies in the house to give me, on the count of four, to give me your best blood-curdling scream, right? A one, a two, a one, two, three, four! <laughs> put a pay to what you say, and put your money where your mouth is, you come and join us on holiday. I wish you were here. I wish you were here. 
here comes the second um, audience participation that I'm going to encourage, and this is for all genders. All right? It's uh, it's another Maltrees guitar part, so I'll just remind you of it. Sounding kind of familiar? Let's rehearse it, count four. One, two, three, four. You've got it. Now, I should add, actually, I, uh, I only encourage these audience participation sections, not because I think there's anything lacking coming from the stage. <laughs> yes, I'm still that guy. Um, I do it solely to get up the nose of my 20-year-old self. Because if he knew, when he got to age 56, he was sitting on a stool with an acoustic guitar, encouraging sing-alongs, he would be fucking mortified. And I like sticking it to him, because over the years, he's caused me a lot of problems. You know? And all of course and it's you Ruby holes I ran your course and I'm blue Black and blue solo album called Things From uh, Things Can Change uh, over the lockdown period, like many other layabouts, and uh, follow the same career path, path as me. Um, uh, some of them are co-writes with friends that we were getting in touch on Zoom calls and, and the like, and, uh, and then as I was sort of closing in at the end of all the writing, um, I was asking various friends if they would be kind enough to guest. So there's a lot of guests on the album. I've got the, the rhythm section is the one that's current rhythm section, which is uh, Pete Howard and Tim Saul, who used to be in Eat. Remember Eat? Okay. i got, uh, covering most of the guitars is Mark Gemini Thwait. Yeah, I uh, you know from The Mission, Tricky, and Peter Murphy. Um, but this song has also got, um, not tonight obviously, but um, on the record, uh, my friend Laura Kidd does a great vocal on this. Um, yeah, you know Laura? So she was, uh, she makes war, uh, these days she's pen friend, and then she's made a wonderful record with my friend Rapt from Ned's Tom, Ned's Tom Dustbin. Woo! 
um, which is out any minute now, and that's under the name Obey Robots. Um, before I play it, I've, I've just got to make you aware of the lyrics to the third verse, because as I've been playing it live, I, I, I've started to realise it, it conjures a really unpleasant image. And I just, okay, let me read it to you, right? It says, there was so much to get me down, so I shook off my dressing gown. I strapped my boots on and I walked into town. It was strange. Now, you, you've got the same feeling as me, I didn't really. It sounds like I've thrown up a dressing gown, I'm completely naked. I put my boots on and I walked into town. Oh, it's strange. No, I put all of my outdoor clothes on. I just couldn't get that line in the way that I stand for that. Just, just so we clear on that. It's called Things Can Change.
one more from, um, from the new album, and then you can turn me into a Wonderstuff jukebox, okay? <laughs> um, this one is, um, this has got a really beautiful, to my mind, um, meaning behind it. So the story goes, it's about a year and a half ago, summer of 2021, uh, myself and my good friend Lainey, who's here tonight selling merch, uh, and two of our friends, Liz and Phil, were out drinking one afternoon. And after about an hour, um, Lainey looked at Liz and said, is now a good time to tell them? And it left this ominous atmosphere hanging over the table. And she went on to explain to us that another friend of ours, Lynn's, uh, was in desperate need of a new kidney. And uh, the girls had got together and uh, all got tested and it turns out Lainey was the match. And Lainey said, and I'm going to be doing it in about five weeks' time. And I'm happy to report a year and a half later, Lainey's fine, but more importantly, Lindsay's absolutely fine. So. so uh, I had this, uh, this, this, this whole thing stuck in my head for weeks, and um, I couldn't think of a more generous, more loving, and a less, less selfless thing to do for a friend. So I wanted to stick these thoughts in a song. Now, because it's me that's written the song, most of the song is about me. <laughs> but the atmosphere's there, and my thoughts are very much with Lainey and Liz. Uh, it's also got my friend Rat from Ned's Atomic Dustbin playing guitar on this track on the album. Yeah. I think that's two woos for, for Rat there, isn't it? I'll let him know. Um, <laughs> Uh, what else was oh yeah, the reason I asked Rap was, uh, Lainey's known Rap for 30 years and uh, not only is uh, he one of her favourite guitarists, uh, it's also one of her favourite people on the planet, so it's good to get Rap in secret on this. Anyway, the song's called And She Gives. Not like I'm clever I just hold it together And out here in the country Feels like no one can touch me Then along comes a girl I don't know her to the end of this world And she shakes me to the core like no one before I knew something was missing And knew all about giving I'd lend help to a stranger A real late game changer But then, then again What you do for a friend That you've known all your life what it is to survive Cause it's all about living Maybe that's what I've been missing And so, long live the lesson While I'm this side of heaven For that time on this earth We'll get all we deserve if you're lucky, you're still, you'll never get ill But then, then again, what you do for a friend That you've known all your life What it is to survive Always been the best of us 
1985, 1987, we were playing gigs in Birmingham and uh, hanging out with the music crowd around there, all the other bands that were around in the bars and the clubs and the venues and then things moved really quickly for the Wonder Stuff. By late 87 we signed a major record deal, we moved to London, Within six months we were touring Europe and North America and everything had pretty much gone to plan. Then in uh, late 89 our original bass player Rob the bass then Jones, he decided to leave and we uh, took a little break which is when I found myself revisiting Birmingham and I revisited the bar, the pubs and bars and venues that we'd started out in and I didn't feel very welcome. In fact, I remember walking into the barrel organ in Digbeth one Saturday night, and one of my old music friends looks at me and goes, oh, here he is, London. <laughs> that was Richard March, the bass player from Pop Will Eat It, so yeah, didn't feel very nice. And I was left with this question, which was, what the fucking hell do you think we were all doing? We formed the band because we wanted to get away from our hometown. We wanted to go and see the world. And uh, I figured that was their plan as well, but I know the poppies pulled it off, but there were a few that didn't. So with those thoughts, I went back to, uh, back to London and I sat down and I wrote this. It's called Caught in My Shadow. <laughs> They've uh, introduced a clean air zone and uh, as we all know these are just taxes on low income people and don't clean the fucking air at all and I ain't ready to give up my big old diesel van so I don't go to Birmingham anymore. There's no Birmingham date on this tour and uh, Birmingham City Council can go and fuck himself. <laughs> Uh, don't get me started on uh, the recycling facility in South Shropshire near where I, I live. That's not going well either. <laughs> if it's not enough, I gave my mum, I sweat my tears and all I said I was.
Okay, so it says down here on my notes that this is where I should play the size of a... Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, Lack of professionality. <laughs> It says down there I should play like the size of a cow and cheap seats next week. You, you strike me as a more discerning. Um, <laughs> well, we'll see if we can get around them a little bit. Um, have a tiny bit more volume in the monitors on this one, please. Excellent, thank you. So this is um, this is a song that we actually recorded during the sessions for no Never Loved Elvis, but we didn't have time to get it on the record for whatever fucking reason. And uh, I was pissing and moaning about it for weeks on end. And I, I remember um, <laughs> Mal Trees, our guitarist, said to me, "Well, Milo, relax about this. At least we've got one good song for the next album." So, <laughs> which is what we did. So. acoustic gigs which I found rather heartwarming was uh, like I didn't take a say at the beginning of that song this is Sing the Absurd I just started it right without your permission and um, and when I did this in Glossop the other night when I sang the opening line there was a from at least four people you know? um, but it reminded me it's not everybody's favorite Bob Dylan album live at Buddha Khan but he's arranged all these classic songs like a reggae version of Lay Lady Lay or something and they're fucking unrecognisable. It's a terrible album, but I have, I have a love for it because the audience don't know what the song is until he sings the first line. 
<laughs> and I've all and I knew that album from when I was about 16 and all my life I've wanted that to happen to me. Um, so let's see how we fare with the next song. Yeah? Yeah. In fact all of them. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, when I got to write, I wrote these two songs in, in, within a couple of weeks of each other, and I was, I've always been influenced by Dylan, and uh, the one thing that I'd never really done or nicked off him was writing shitload of lyrics. So the next two songs have shitloads of lyrics, like five or six verses. And I was very proud of myself. In fact, I think me and Terry Staunton from the NME talk about it in a, um, an interview that we did. We came to the Rockfield studio where we were recording it at the time. And then he wrote about it, and it's like, Mark's getting in at dinner and all this. 
Um, anyway, later on, I seriously came to regret writing so many lyrics for these two songs. <laughs> when I was publishing my diaries, my books, I did what a lot of other uh, songwriters have done in recent years, which is do handwritten lyrics and sell them to audience members. Um, and of course, the two fucking favourite ones from people like you were this one and the next one. And I mean, who writes anymore? I don't write anymore. So my hands were like uh, fossilised claws. Days and days and days, writing about 500 copies of this out. Anyway, so. Let's carry on with the cheer after the first line. So. Yeah. Festival called the Festival of the Midnight Sun. 
<laughs> and we were, it's, it's in Finland or North Luna, maybe North of Finland. Anyway, it's when it's daylight for, I think, six months. And it's when Finnish people commit most suicides because it fucking drives them crazy. And they do go absolutely crazy because they, it's just day for months on end and they drink themselves. <laughs> anyway, so we go on about one o'clock in the morning, <clears throat> and it's daylight, and then Dylan goes on about three o'clock in the morning, and then about five in the morning, me and my first manager, Les Johnson, um, were sitting in the hotel bar, and uh, I, I like Dylan, but Les Johnson is a Dylan nut, and then Les starts to look all intense while he's sitting at this stool, uh, on these high stools together, he goes, Dylan's just walked in. I'm like, fuck off, he goes, look over your shoulder, Dylan's just walked in. So Dylan's at the bar, sitting on a high bar stool, on his own. There is no one else in the bar. It's just me, Les, and Dylan. I said, go and say hello. <laughs> and he goes, Milo, I've seen what you're like when people try to say hello to you. I ain't fucking going over to Dylan. <laughs> so, so he in the end, he plucks up the courage and he walks to, and there was nobody else in this room, so he walks towards Bob Dylan, he's taking about 10 steps and five security guys just come out of nowhere. I've never seen anything like it. And they very gently just put their arm around Les and steered him back to where he was sitting and said, Mr. D Mr. Dylan would like to be alone right now. And Les was like, absolutely fine, absolutely fine. It was one of the most amazing, brilliant things that I've seen. And you watch when I go out for a bag <laughs> So, I'll tell you more about this in a minute.
Okay. <laughs> so. I have uh, one more from my new album that I'd like to play you. And um, this, so Les Johnson, my first manager that was taken away by Dylan's security. Um, his son uh, has been one of my dearest friends since he was five years old, uh, Luke Johnson. And uh, the whole Johnson clan now live out in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and during the lockdowns, Luke and I got together on, you know, Zooms and FaceTimes. And, um, and he was like, he's got this great sort of American Birmingham accent now. And, uh, and when we first got on the, on the call, he was like, dude, you've got to forgive me. Uh, it was just all over. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, he, he says, what are you doing? You know, why are you locked up at home? And I'm like, I'll do a bit of writing. And, he, and then he said to me, I've got a shitload of um, a, a, instrumental demos. Would you like to see if you can find songs in them? So this is one of them. Uh, but when he presented it to me, it was kind of in that sort of emo, what Americans think punk rock is, uh, like Blink-182. I've never heard it, never knowingly heard anything by Blink-182, but, you know, tattoos and coloured hair and all this shit. And it's sort of fast, and, and that's kind of Luke's area of music. But I did, I found the song in it, and then by the time I recorded it for this album, which is on sale this evening in the popular CD format, um, <laughs> along with some other very fine souvenirs, to remember such a special night by. Um, so I, I've given it like a sort of Texas country swing, and I think Luke is secretly horrified. <laughs> Perhaps if we sell enough of them and it generates some royalties for Luke, then he'll let go of his problems. <laughs> anyway, it was a song that I was doing a lot. Um, I did lots of Facebook Lives during the time we were all locked down. <laughs> Thank you. As it is, I'm completely comfortable with my own company, and it's probably for best for everyone that I know that I spend a lot of time on my own as well. But uh, no, it was, it was fucking great, wasn't it? Just knowing that we were connecting, I, I loved it. I loved it, so thanks for being here. So I, was, I introduced this song then, and it's called In My Sights. Waiting for the one I thought I had her, but she's 
From the last Wonder Stuff album, or the most recent Wonder Stuff album, uh, called Better Being Lucky. Um, uh, we released this in, thank you, uh, in 2019. And uh, it's one of my favourite songs I've ever written. So to be my age uh, and feel like that about a song is, is a very heartwarming feeling. So I, I'm going to dedicate this one to me this evening. And, uh, it's called Don't Anyone Dare Give a Damn. Sooner or later there will be sacrifices It's enough to make you cry Trust anyone to panic in a crisis It's hit or miss on who will be decisive It's enough to make you cry Take my word, I'm not making this up, I'm not taking a cut, I'm not even the one to make the call. All my life I'm not trying to judge, I won't even begrudge a mistake when they come, I will for small.
also factor the size of a cow. <laughs> it's the song that, um... So you know the way that Porrick Jack like split the audience in two and you all wonderfully did the backing vocal and uh, well I have a split the audience in two thing but it's nowhere near as wonderful and creative and musical as that. It's just that I happened to write this song in 1990 called The Size of a Cab and half the crowd like it and half the crowd <laughs> fucking hate it. And I know what the split is. It's basically the half the crowd that hate it are like uh, they're the people that got into us on you know, when Janice Long first played Unbearable and uh, you know and then they bought Eight Leg Grooming, they bought the t-shirt and we were like this hairy bunch of oiks and it was cool to like us and probably itself and shit like that. And then by our third album we wrote we we wrote an out and out on a shame with pop song and made a very cartoony video and uh, lots of little kids started to come to our gigs and all that sort of hip lot at the beginning, oh fuck it, they're rubbish. <laughs> I don't give a fuck either way because it's the song that makes the most money from me. So. And it's just again a little bit more of a so, If you don't like it, just sit on your hands or grin and bear it. And those that do you you know you can sing along with Oh, I should also mention we we've, we've gone past the hour bit in my set now. I I only ever think like I do an hour. It generally runs to an hour and a half, so officially now we're in the encore section. <laughs> and I bring it up because uh, I'm sick of like hiding behind curtains where you hopefully get a, a rhythmic clap together. I find it very patronising on both sides, so I've done away with that. But I bring it up because <laughs> I don't want to see any moaning tomorrow on social media that says the miserable old bastard doesn't even do encores anymore. <laughs> This is the Oh wow, look at me now 
The only song on Never Loved Elvis that I didn't instigate the writing on. Um, that was brought to me as an instrumental by the multi-instrumentalist uh, Fiddly Bell. Um, um, and uh, yeah, then I wrote that ridiculous song for it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna play one that one of mine.
no fucking sense whatsoever if I don't get the back and vote on this, okay? <laughs> so this is really, this is on you. And it's just one word, and it's not dizzy. Sessions, and it's making me feel cool. What's in 
security team and, uh, and then I'll be over with Lainey by the uh, the merch after about 10 minutes if you want to come and say hello snap a picture or whatever so uh, yeah thank you so much you're fucking great to play with.
some more.